The whole point of make is that the children are still the maximum levels are safe and you are all right to write your GR course. Thank you. Uh, so I want to have something on the topic I've been working on for it's been a year now. Przepraszam, bo dźwięk jest okropny. Part of some larger project. Hello, hello. Extremal and extremal levels. Czy, halo, czy, czy można dźwięk poprawić? Nic nie słychać. Kind of quantum, but even if you have much quantum unity, should I should spend the time to bring yourself so hopefully it will be interesting to a lot of people. Uh, may I help you? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Hello, hello. Tak naprawdę coś słychać, ale się nie nie da nie da zrozumieć. Hello, hello. Czy mnie słychać teraz może? Proszę napisać na czacie. To znaczy, panie Maćku, niezależnie od tego, czy ktoś ma y, pozytywne czy negatywne nastawienie do quantum gravity. Tak? Nic nie da się zrozumieć. Ok, so I think we have some early problems now. Um... Odgłosiłem, może teraz. Odgłosz okay. now. No, coś słychać, ale po prostu beznadziejnie. Is there an echo? Or, 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 or... So, uh, so, so, Okay, uh, what about now? Trochę lepiej jest, ale jest to nadziei. Jest chyba wyłączony, więc... Oczywiście. I może ktoś nie zna, czy ktoś nie zna Pan przypadkiem? Um, okay, can you hear me now? No, teraz jest lepiej. Teraz trochę lepiej. Okay, so I'll try to speak loudly. Uh, maybe I can. Okay, we'll try to do that. Um, so let me start with some introduction about black holes in general, especially black holes in ADS, because and this may be a bad news to some of you. Most of this talk will happen in ADS. Only at the end, we'll go back to uh, vanishing cosmological constant. Mm. So it is well known fact that black holes are very simple objects and that, that, that they are parameterized by only a few parameters by mass, angular momentum, and charge. Uh, but it's no longer true when we include a cosmological constant. In particular, in AD, uh, in particular, ADS has a time-like boundary 
So as a result, it is not globally hyperbolic. And since it's not a globally hyperbolic, to have any reasonable physics at all, we need to impose some sort of boundary condition at infinity. And you know, we can do that in many different ways. Mm. So for example, we may impose some conditions that the metric approaches something and the Maxwell field also approaches something fixed. And clearly, if those fields are not axially symmetric, then the space time cannot be axially symmetric as, uh, as well, because you cannot have a solution uh, to if uh, you cannot have axially symmetric solution uh, to Einstein equations if the boundary conditions are not axially symmetric. Uh, just some coordinates here. And R. R is the distance such that R at infinity is the Called yeah, only one. Yeah, so you have one coordinate that is the distance to the boundary. So the boundary is located at infinity, and then you have all the other coordinates. So, so my question is as follows R is a coordinate? Yes. And if you R is the rest of the coordinates. So R is coordinate, and if you is a coordinate. Yes. Yeah. So, so it is infinity in four dimensions. Yeah. Why would that be? So because it is five dimensions. No, it's in any dimension right now. So, so how many views are in this? In this? Z minus one, where D is my dimension. So, so Yeah. So, so very nice again. So, 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 uh, as in, and I'm only interested in the part that uh, the, the, I'm not interested in the part with index R here. But well, it's really want, it's really not important for. No, no, I think it's like R and then you have the boundary condition. Yeah. Boundary condition. Actually, it's not. Actually, no, it's not. So in the gauge I'm using, that I this is just an introductory slide, and it's not very important. Oh. In, the, in the gauge so, I'm using, um, this has the same range as this one. So, so the question is as follows: mm -hmm. On R equal constant fly, G mu nu is an induced metric. Yes. It's not the full space time metric. Yes. So this is fine. Okay. Come on, this. Yeah, but we Great, thanks. Uh, so the whole point is that you, uh, that in ideas, you have to impose some sort of boundary conditions, and depending on the boundary conditions, you will get different solutions inside. So, in particular, if your boundary conditions are not axiomatic, you won't get Fermi. Mm, now, I want to say something about black holes. So, in general. Solution. Solution of what? Einstein Maxwell equations, for example. There are many solutions. Of course. And I'm going to be interested. I'm going to be interested in a black hole solution. I understood as uh, or in general, I'm going to be interested in stationary solutions. Ah. So my boundary conditions are going to be stationary, and then I'm looking for stationary solutions in the Stationary function. with respect to something which we, at the moment, don't know. Yeah. I mean, so in general, if we have a healing vector field that becomes now, uh, it may become now at its healing horizon, and then under some reasonable assumptions, uh, you may show that it's uh, almost uh, that it's self accelerating with certain parameter that is a constant. Uh, and this constant may be uh, as proportional to the Hawking temperature. And I'm going to be interested in the extremal limit where this constant approaches zero. So if you think about, uh, for example, Reisner Nordstrom uh, black hole, uh, then this. Uh, 
constant equals zero or Hawking's temperature equals zero just means that the inner and outer horizon coincide. Uh, so why should you care about it in general? So per, uh, first of all, you don't get Hawking radiation, or at least you don't get thermal Hawking radiation. So perhaps there is some simplified quantum description. And in the last uh, few years, uh, our knowledge uh, uh, of quantum maxima black holes uh, got much better. So there is a lot of activities done in this direction. Then maximal black holes are motivation for something called weak gravity conjecture in the quantum gravity that roughly speaking says that uh, for any consistent quantum gravity gra uh, or you know more general theory that contains gravity, gravity should be in some sense the weakest force. Uh, uh, in the ADS-CFT dictionary, those external black holes, uh, or actually the horizons describe uh, infrared fixed point of the RG flow of the theory at the boundary. I don't want to talk too much about it. And also, if you care about supersymmetry, all supersymmetry black holes are automatically extremal. Uh, so near an extremal horizon, we may introduce a coordinate system that is called uh, Gaussian null coordinates in which the metric and the Maxwell field looks like this. And the horizon is located at r equals z. So the fact that uh, this is actually my horizon uh, comes from the fact that we have this r squared here and all those objects h, f, gamma, and those other letters, they, they, they are functions of r and x. But they are not functions of v because we assume that d upon dv is a killing vector. Because, as I said, we are interested in stationary solutions. So, x a is an internal coordinate on a surface. Yes. So, what does it mean? Uh, can you show the previous one? This one? No. This one? Oh, this one. What does it mean? This connection. The connection is four dimensional or? Some connection on the horizon. Uh, this is four dimensional. Or, you know, when you say it's a space time. Be, space time. So, 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 yeah. Dimension. Yeah, sure. You, you write a, you know, return, you yeah, so in general, this is supposed to be space time expression and this. Express and here those indices are indeed internal indices. Now, on this, we may consider a one parameter family of different morphisms such that we rescale V by dividing it by some epsilon, we multiply R, R coordinates by some epsilon, and we keep those internal uh, coordinates untouched. So, what, what does it mean, roughly speaking, is that we are getting closer, and, and then we want to take. Uh, the limit with epsilon going to zero. So what it means physically is that we are getting closer and closer to the horizon because this approach is zero. And to, but, but when we are getting closer and closer to an object, this, uh, this object looks bigger to us. So this is why we need to use stretch time. And although this is although say, this limit of epsilon going to zero is no longer a different morphism. Uh, those two objects actually have good limits as a sign goes to, the, to zero, and thus they define a new solution to the Einstein Maxwell, perhaps with uh, uh, cosmological constant equations. And those solutions describe only region that lives very closely to the horizon. And then this limiting space time satisfies some simpler equations. Those are written assuming that the magnetic field is zero. Uh, we can further simplify if we assume that this is static. And then we have some uniqueness theorems. For example, that, the on, that in four dimensions, the only static solution that is charged is given by the limit of uh, extrema Reisner Nordstrom ideas. So it means that if in four dimensions, even if you look for static solution, even uh, if your metric uh, at infinity is not spherically symmetric, then close to the horizon, you gain uh, you, you gain uh, spherically symmetric space. Then. 
And the closer you're getting, the more strictly symmetric it looks. And in particular, in this limit, you lose all the information about non spherical symmetry at infinity. This perhaps suggests that in some sense, extremal black holes are simpler, that you don't need to know uh, too much about what happens at infinity, and the horizon are going to be. Uh, but, but what happens uh, and what happens close to the horizon is uh, uh, independent of uh, that. And so this was the introduction. I don't know if you have questions to this part. If not, let me continue. So the first chapter of this story uh, is about extremal black holes in ABS. And I want to convince you that almost all of, the, all of them are actually singular. Uh, no, no, stationary. Yeah, that was just an example that in static case, you, you gain spherical symmetry in this new horizon limit. Uh, so let me start with a very simple example that will just show you what the basic idea is. So on the background of the extrema rising and also ADS, I want to consider a massless scalar field, and I'm, we're going to look for stationary solutions. Now, since the background is spherically symmetric, we can, uh, we can decompose our field into spherical harmonics, and then we get some simple ODE for this thing. Now, this ODE has a regular similar point at the horizon. So near the horizon, we can approximate it by the Euler equation, and solutions to this Euler equation are simply given by, um, by some power law. Or in other words, we're just doing Frobenius method. And we find two possible exponents. Uh, minus exponent is always negative, so that would mean that the scalar field actually diverges at the horizon. So if we want to impose regularity, some sort of regularity at the horizon, we must choose plus one field. Okay. Uh, if we choose in this expression L equal one, yeah. Exactly. Uh, what you say that we are close to the horizon, right? Yeah. What does it mean close to the horizon? Yeah, just show me the same stuff. Because I expect that you at some point would like to have this two horizon merge, right? Yeah. I mean, well, I, this is already at the extremal, uh, at extremality. So you already? Yes. Already yeah. Right? yeah. Oh. Uh, if we choose L equal one mode, then uh, we will be exponent that is smaller than one as long as the cosmological constant is negative. And thus, as a result, uh, energy momentum tensor, or at least some, uh, some part of it, actually diverges, uh, actually diverges as we approach the horizon. So you could ask, does it actually matter? Because this one of the first things that you learn in uh, your GR1 course is that actually coordinate systems can be misleading. And this is just a component of a tensor in some coordinate system. So maybe there's just a problem with coordinates. Uh, so you could ask about square, scalar quantities like the trace or the square of this object. But actually, you can, it's not hard to show that actually all objects that you can, or scalar objects that you can build from uh, the spirit are going to be finite at the, uh, at the horizon. So that would suggest, oh, yeah, that's really a problem with coordinates. Maybe we shouldn't care about it. But then you may actually write, oh, I'm sorry, there is a type of here. It should be D upon zero. That this vector is actually tangent to the affinity. Uh, parameterized net geodesic, so it has a well different interpretation. And this is a good, from the point of view of, uh, of geometry, this is a well defined, uh, well defined system at the, uh, at the horizon, right? It's more like adding some filters than uh, coordinates. And moreover, it's exactly this component of the energy momentum tensor that enters Rechadure equation. So that this has a clear physical naming. It means that uh, if you would try to do uh, calculate back reaction and so forth, 
we would find out that uh, null rays uh, emitted uh, from uh, that there is something very wrong with the expansion of null rays emitting from the horizon or approaching the horizon. Mm. So we we'll see that almost all extrema black holes in ADS have tidal forces in the null direction transversal to the horizon. So this row direction uh, uh, and those tidal forces are actually diverged. But at the same time, uh, in this example and in all of them, uh, this statement, uh, okay, on one hand, this statement is independent of the any asymptotic condition. So we only need asymptotic conditions to sort, uh, for example, this uh, sort the scalar field, uh, and this, uh, but that's it. Uh, and at the same time, we'll see this problem that all scalar quantities are actually finite at the horizon. What means almost? Well, because clearly Reisner notion ideas is not singular. So if you fine tune everything, you won't get this singularity. I, I will make it more precise in a moment. Uh, now, let me uh, allow me for uh, yeah. You have fixed the uh, in this example, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But then uh, at some point, I will show you what happens at the nonlinear level where we can impose that we have extrema horizon in the bulk. And we will see that no, that we get a singularity at this horizon uh, in a nonlinear theory. So it's not just an artifact of linearity. Okay, but simple case, you have some kind of infinities mm -hmm. which are geometric. Yes. yes. Geometric, but not scalar. But not scalar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, allow me for a uh small detour now uh so you could ask uh is that at all surprised uh because uh as it was already said in horizon notion in general we have two horizons and we just took the limit where those two horizons coincide and one of those horizons is um one of those horizons is actually uh, Cauchy horizon, and we actually expect that things should behave badly at the Cauchy horizon. Uh, so maybe that's not surprising at all. Mm -hmm. And it seems it's not something we understood right now uh, in 100 percent, but it seems that at least partially this intuition is correct. Uh, but what we can say is that if you have a singularity at the Cauchy horizon, then it translates into some sort of uh, non-smoothness at the uh, non-smoothness uh, at the uh, at, uh, at the extrema horizon. So let us look at this expression. If we would, for example, translate it into a positive cosmological constant, then generically we will also find. Uh, but, 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 so if we would look at the non-extrema horizon notion either with positive or a negative uh, uh, cosmological constant, and we would look at the behavior of this field close to the Cauchy horizon, still in the stationary, only for the stationary mode, we would find out that they diverge logarithmically. So actually, the, the, this is uh, where it divergence than this one, right? Uh, and, but then when we take this limit, we obtain some power law, and for example, for negative cosmological constant, this power law is such that this field is uh, C zero, but it's not C one at the horizon. But for positive cosmological constant, it's actually going to be C two at the horizon. And you can actually check that for the vanishing cosmological constant, this is fine tuned to give you exactly integers. So then you have perfect smoothness if the cosmological uh, if the cosmological constant vanishes. Uh, so it, it seems that we don't have a, a well-defined prescription uh, 
uh, have to read off from the singular decoction horizon what happens uh, what happens with this exponent. But it could be actually works. In ADS, it makes sense to consider a massive plane Gordon field with a negative mass squared. Not too much negative, but uh, there is some window of negative mass squared allowed. And then you can check what happened. And then you, uh, with this expression, and then you would find out that this exponent, uh, that this exponent, uh, that both exponents are actually negative. So if you have a two, yeah. This is the spherical symmetry. Yeah. So, so the cast of, of the horizon uh, of the spherical are just the standard units, not units, but, but such as round spheres. Yes, yes. This is why I can decompose everything into spherical harmonics. The spherical Yeah, those are fine. Yes, but the yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm looking now for max uh, for Klein Gordon fields that breaks this spherical symmetry. Yeah, yeah, but, but the background, yes, yes, from the spatial ADS, I read the but yeah. Uh, yeah, and this is not okay. Yes. You don't change the method, so you don't need some correction. At some point, I will, but right now it's just uh, it's just first order. Uh, so you can, by choosing uh, a field with negative mass, you can actually make both those exponents neg negative and, uh, and at the same time, uh, at the Cauchy horizon in a nearly extremal black hole, you will just find log divergence. So you can also make this actually behaving worse than at the Cauchy horizon. Uh, so it seems that there is some connection, but we don't understand it fully now. Mm. That, that, that. So now we'll go to actually Einstein Maxwell equations, still linearized. So this is uh, this is for now the general nearly near extremal black hole, uh, black hole background. And notice that this has at least two symmetries, right? Because it has this d upon dv symmetry, but also it has also a scale symmetry. Uh, that is essentially induced by taking the new horizon limit. And since we are looking at for stationary solutions, we may actually decompose our perturbations into eigen, uh, eigen functions of, uh, of this uh, killing vector field. Uh, so the point is that uh, we can decompose our perturbations into power. Laws. That's, that's mm, the main thing. And then it's not hard to check and uh, just from uh, <laughs> properties that uh, in general the bio tensor for those perturbation uh, will behave like rho uh, to gamma minus two. So we have actually a singularity and this is again, bio tensor in this coordinate system actually measures uh, tidal forces that are fields by, uh, by an infoing observer. So that means that uh, an endpoint observer would uh, would suffer from the singularity, and we have the singularity provided that this exponent is smaller than two and different than one. And this does not necessarily imply that those uh, uh, black holes are not solutions in a distributional sense. So Einstein Maxwell equation, but it may also happen if this exponent is smaller than one half. So if it's one half or smaller, then we don't even have an honest solution at the correct. Mm, now let us go back to this uh, right the north in background because it's so simple. So uh, because uh, it's maximally symmetric. We may decompose everything uh, into spherical harmonics or toroidal harmonics and so on, because in ADS you can have black holes that are not spherical but actually toroidal or hyperbolic ones. And uh, th this is a well known uh, way of decomposing 
uh, decomposing uh, perturbations. Uh, in the um, standard language, we are only looking at the scalar derived perturbation. Uh, and when we substituted, the whole point is that uh, linear Einstein Markov equations that are, you know, in general are some PDEs actually decompose into a system of linear algebraic equations. And the good thing is that linear algebraic equations are really simple and we can solve them. And then uh, non trivial solutions exist only when some appropriate determinants vanishes. And this leads to some condition for this exponent. And for each merk, uh, we find four possible values of this exponent. So let us first look at this three polarized normal spin ADS. And we obtain this extremely uh, non elegant uh, uh, expression for this. And uh, as I said, we have four, four, uh, four possible values uh, corresponding to plus minus zero and plus minus zero. If we choose minus zero, this is clearly negative. So uh, we can always discard two uh, exponents by imposing regularity at the horizon, and we are left, left with two positive ones. Mm. Now, L, L equal one mode is exceptional essentially because. Gravity is a quadruple force, so uh, L equal no one mode is described only uh, only Maxwell perturbations. So we need to solve for it separately, and then we have two possible values, and we choose the positive one. Uh, okay, so this may be a little complex to actually check in real life. So let me just plot it, and here is what we get. So for L equal two mode with plus and minus, and this is one of the modes we cannot discard. This is always smaller than one. And for sufficiently large black holes, roughly speaking of the radius of ADS, but still smaller, uh, uh, this expense is actually smaller than one half. So that means that generally, if you're, if you're doing some uh, perturbation and in your perturbation you have this L equal to mode, uh, you generically land below gamma equal one. So it means that you have diverging side of force and they are actually not even integrable across the horizon. So it means that this is something that would truly kill anyone falling inside. And then for larger black holes, uh, we don't even get a weak, weak solution to Einstein Maxwell equations at the horizon. Uh, so then we can do the same thing at the uh, for toroidal black holes. We get another not very elegant uh, uh, expression again for exponents. We get rid of two of them by regularity, but now there is a qualitative difference uh, if. Uh, if our black hole is sufficiently small, then uh, those momenta, then eigenvalues of the Laplacian of this black hole, of this torus are going to be large. And then uh, those two exponents are actually going to be larger than this. So it means that uh, very small black holes are actually fine. And we have some threshold on uh, how large the black hole can be. If it's larger than generically, again, it's going to be singular. And then we can do play the same game for uh, Reiner Nordstrom. And uh, now it's uh, more fun because um, and now it's more fun because you can have a different geometries uh, on hyperbolic surfaces, but from uh, some relatively recent, so, so we get some when it's going to be uh, when it's going to be singular and from some re relatively recent bands on the behavior of uh, Laplacian on the hyperbolic surfaces, it follows that it will be all for every hyperbolic surfaces there will be modes such that this gamma is smaller than two, so that we get uh, extremity, uh, so that we will get singularity. But then, uh, and this was actually even without charge, because uh, in uh, ADS, uh, hyperbolic black holes can be extremal without charge. And then we could actually turn on the charge and obtain some more solutions. And there's 
again something funny that if we take black hole that is sufficiently large uh, then actually uh, if the black hole is sufficiently large then actually this uh, one of the supposed to be positive exponents becomes negative so it means that we have three negative exponents only one positive and that would mean that if you try to do perturbation theory and you turn on this uh, this mode and infinity, for example, uh, you would find out that everything is diverging very badly at, the, at this horizon, and you cannot do this uh, consistently. Um, so uh, our whole perturbation scheme breaks down, and this suggests, at least at the linear level, it means actually that curvature scalars are diverging. But as I said, you cannot really trust it as a solution to Einstein Maxwell equation at all. Um, so, this is what is called in ADSCP RG instability that a small change in the boundary conditions at infinity leads to drastic change in the new horizon region. So, uh, let me give you a few more re remarks about it. So, first of all, uh, the bigger our black hole is, the worse the singularity, singularity gets. And this is counterintuitive because normally we think about large black holes uh, having very small curvature. Here it's the point one. <coughs> uh, for sufficiently large black holes, also other modes are divergent. And although we have restricted ourselves to the electri electrically charged black holes, the same is true for magnetically charged black holes. Essentially, because in four dimensions we have a uh, electromagnetic duality, so we can exchange them. And also for positive cosmological constant, we have something similar. Let me go back to to that. So, for example, for this node here, if we would turn a positive cosmological, if we would have actually a positive cosmological constant, this curve would go like. So that means that we, at least for small black holes this time, this exponent is between one and two. And so that means that we also have a singularity for positive cosmological constant, but it's uh, mild. And in particular, it's integrable. So if someone would be falling, they would uh, feel some sort of discomfort, but they could actually live with that. Mm. Okay, so for so far everything was static, and clearly static black holes are not the most general thing that we could have. So we could also have rotating holes. So then we took this care ideas. Uh, care, uh, we looked at care ideas perturbations, and uh, now the nice thing is that for axially symmetric near horizon geometries, uh, you can also show that the only possibility is care ideas, or actually the limit of care ideas. So it means that we're again not not losing anything. Um, now this calculation is easier. To, uh, uh, it's easier to work directly with the curvature instead of the metric, and because we can use the Tchaikovsky equation. And one of the unknowns in the Tchaikovsky equation is exactly this part of the y tensor that we are interested in. So uh, that's cool and. Uh, uh, here we are interested in a solutions that are, that are stationary from the point of view of the horizon. So it means that they are co-rotating with the horizon. But uh, that means, assuming that if they are not axially symmetric, that means that they are actually not stationary at infinity. Mm, this can be done almost analytically. So uh, to, because Tchaikovsky equation can be uh, 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 in this limit can be uh, uh, almost an entity calculated the only numerical part is to find eigenvalues of an angular equation and then we can plot it so now this gamma uh, uh, this is slightly different gamma because this gamma here is ex already exponent of this vital tensor component so it was it would be gamma minus two on the previous slides uh, and we see that it's negative, so it means that we again get negative, uh, that we again get singularity. And up to this point, 
here it's, it's smaller than one, uh, larger than minus one, so it's integrable, so it's a mild singularity. And uh, okay, so here we get somewhere here we get uh, it's no longer a weak solution, and then uh, here it becomes uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, no, never mind. So starting from here, it's actually a really serious singularity that would kill anyone falling inside. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, so it's for axially symmetric perturbation. Uh, so this mode is always singular at the horizon. And in, but in general, yeah, in the it's neither, and in particular, that was my, my mistake. Uh, in a moment, this uh, exponent for the metric is always larger than one half. So it means that it always makes sense in a distributional sense. Uh, however, if we additionally break the uh, rotational symmetry, uh, then we get complex exponents uh, and with real part, which is equal minus uh, five over two. So it's really, really bad. But this is actually not surprising. This is a sign of super radiant instability of her ideas. Although we still don't actually know what's the endpoint of this uh, of this instability. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, everything here was presented as a linear analysis. This is slightly more than that. So if we assume that our metric and Maxwell field actually have this tower law behavior close to the horizon, th then it's actually uh, exact, but it's some sort of an answer. So now we want to do numerics to check that this answer is actually satisfied. And to do that, it's actually very hard to numerically probe extremal black holes. It's much easier to start with black holes at finite temperature and then lower this temperature. So for temperatures that are close to zero, there is a huge near horizon region in which this space time looks exactly like it was extremal. So there's this ADS to probe. Mm. So we may expect that every physical field, including white tensor, should behave like in the extremal case in this probe. So it should grow. However, uh, it does not approach exactly horizon because this probe ends at some point, roughly speaking, at the radius of the order of the temperature. And then something happens, but we just may assume that it's nothing spectacular. So if it was very large, then it should be still very large, assuming some sort of continuity. So one can argue that this uh, the device tensor is going to have the same power at the horizon, for example, is going to have the same power of behavior like before, but now with the temperature instead of the distance. So it will be temperature to the same power as uh, in the extremal case. And this is the best way we, we think of to probe those exponents uh, with a reasonable accuracy. And here are some particular results. Uh, so here we have uh, white tensor, and here we have temperature. Uh, this is log log scale. So the straight line means that we have. Uh, power of behavior. Uh, this black line is our theoretical prediction, prediction and those blue points are uh, uh, those blue points are uh, what was actually uh, obtained numerically. And you may see that there is a really nice uh, that uh, those two exponents are very close to each other. So it seems that our uh, our linear analysis really and uh, goes through. Uh, if we go to the second order in perturbation theory, we can actually uh, argue that also the area of the black hole will change with the temperature. Now with the exponent that is equal to to the power of gamma. So in particular, if this gamma is smaller than one half, it means that the entropy gets some anomalous, uh, gets some additional term that for sufficiently small temperatures is going to dominate over the usual thermal behavior. And in particular, that means that uh, the specific heat of our black hole, uh, say a fixed charge, uh, has a, a anomalous 
failing uh, at low temperatures. And this is a clear sign for the holographic theory. Uh, this is something, the, the, so this is a prediction for the CFT that lives on the boundary. And you, again, you can check uh, here, this red line is what we expect from the numerics. Uh, this black line, and so this is logarithmic, uh, uh, um, the, the, there is this logarithmic derivative of, uh, of the specific heat. So if it was just power law, it would be a constant. And uh, we see that it approaches this red line that is given by our uh, linear analysis. And the black line is what should happen just for Ryzen and Austin ADS without, uh, uh, without, uh, without this perturbation. So again, it seems that our linear analysis uh, is confirmed. Uh, okay, uh, uh, before I will uh, go to the next part, do you have any questions to this classical part? Uh, if not, allow me for uh, yet another digression. So, uh, as I said, all uh, with, uh, with an exception of this hyperbole of those hyperbolic black holes, uh, all stellar quantities that you can calculate at the horizon. So for example, Kretschmann scalar or something like that are actually small at the horizon and are actually given by, uh, just by the background value. Uh, so the, the, they're small. Uh, so if you would take our Ryzen and Norton ideas, uh, this perturbed one, this is a static black hole, so it's very easy to analytically continue it to Euclid, uh, to Euclidean uh, signature. You simply replace time by I times Euclidean time. And then we get a solution that is actually uh, free of any singularities. Because in a Euclidean signature, uh, the only measure of singularity is uh, are uh, curvature scalars. So if all curvature scalars are finite are on, and actually small, then it means uh, then it means that uh, uh, th then it means that it's perfectly smooth. So from the point of view of the gravitational path integral of something like that, you could interpret it in such a way that it's actually possible to create um, by a path integral black holes like that. So there is no, it seems that although they're singular, there is no good reason to get rid of them. It's not like a negative mass Schwarzschild or something. This is some singularity that is actually part of your theory. Moreover, because all, uh, usually when we try to incorporate some quantum corrections, and this is something we will do in a moment, actually. Uh, we, we say whether quantum corrections are important or not by checking curvature scales, right? And then we can try to build some effective action describing them. And in this case, all of the, all those corrections are going to be small. So you shouldn't, ex so even though you have a singularity, uh, you shouldn't expect that quantum gravity will change this picture, mm, at least at the, exactly at the singularity, um, assuming that it makes sense to talk about effective action. Uh, and now I want to say a few more things about effective field theory. Mm, so now we're going to this quantum, quantum but general part. Uh, so there are many reasons to actually believe that general relativity is, in fact, only a low energy description of whatever the fundamental theory is. Uh, and we could try to be very ambitious and uh, formulate whatever UV completion of the theory, but instead we could try to parameterize it effectively. Uh, for example, as a series in derivatives. And if we know this UV completion, we can obtain what the uh, coefficients in this. But if we don't, we can just, uh, you know, plug the most general thing, the general form that we can think of. And so uh, our 
Einstein Hilbert action is the two derivative actions, right? Because the Ricci contains the second derivative, uh, derivative of the metric. And then we could try to build something uh, out of four derivatives, so essentially Riemann squared. But in four dimensions, you can check that it cannot change anything, essentially because uh, in four dimensions, we have uh, uh, we have topological invariant that uh, some combination of Riemann squared and Ricci squared and Ricci scalar squared when integrated over the whole manifold. And uh, this is just a topological term. So that means that it if we add something like that to the action, it cannot change equations of motion. So it means that uh, in four dimensions, uh, our effective description must actually start at six derivative term. And then by uh, some tricks with field redefinitions, you can show that the only possible term is given by the cubic in the Riemann and looks like this. So every and other term that you can this, which remains the, uh, the met metric uh, Lagrange, yeah? yeah so, yes, so this is just an addition to the Einstein Hilbert Yeah. It is always equivalent to standard general relativity with extra matter field. Sure, but in this way we have a I think we have a better control over possible terms that you can actually show that if you consider terms with six derivatives in metric, then by future definitions and integration by parts, you can always make them to this form. So this is the only possible term in six derivatives and the only possible and at eight derivatives we have two possible terms uh, which are essentially Riemann squared squared. So this one and um, this one here, this still there is um, duality in, so this is, uh, those three, this is our antithetic, so we can dualize it and this is this uh, artisan. Mm. And now we could ask what happens with the extremal curve for such theory. And because we expect that those, star, uh, that those coefficients uh, those couple factors are chosen in such a way that those coefficients are dimensionless, so we expect that they should be very small. So we are going to only work with uh, treat this as a linear perturbation on the curve vector. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, oh, because I, again, I didn't say that that if you if you would go back to the to this result, so to the Stoichkovsky equation. Mm -hmm. Uh, in general, you would find out that for negative cosmological constant, we get singularity. For positive cosmological constant, we don't get singularity, but we get some sort of non smoothness. So, this uh, curvature exponent is going to be positive, but it's not going to be uh, integer or something. But if, uh, if cosmological constant is zero, then those exponents are exactly positive integers. So uh, perturbations, uh, stationary perturbations of extremal care without the cosmological constant are actually smooth. Uh, so, the, and this is clearly some sort of fine tuning. So the question is whether quantum corrections that here are just general terms that we could write down, uh, whether the, uh, they remove this fine tuning or not. Uh, so first, uh, I won't give you all the formulas uh, because they're long and not very illuminating. But our strategy is that, that we first find uh, the new horizon limit of curve. This is, of course, true when well known it was done in 19 by uh, by Bardin and Horowitz. Then we calculated uh, EFT corrections to this new horizon limit. So we get something still in the near horizon answers, but with those corrections. And then on this background, we looked for transversal deformation. Because we are in the near horizon limit, those deformations still follow power law behavior. Mm -hmm. This can be done, this can be written down as source linearized Einstein equations on this Bardin Horowitz metric background. And th those, they can be actually solved exactly those linearized equations, 
And then at the leading uh, for the leading exponent that started, so this is again exponent in the metric field. Uh, oh, oh yeah, I see. Um, so this uh, leading exponent started with two, so it was an integer, so it was smooth. And then afterward, we get those linear corrections that looks like this. So in one part is that it's definitely not smooth anymore. So this is uh, some number that is either larger or smaller than two, but it's not an integer, so it's some sort of no smoothness. Uh, and actually, this ex this particular exponent describes transversal deformation that just comes out from the fact that Kerr black hole is asymptotically flat. So in this case, it's not even that we need to add some additional perturbation. This singularity, uh, this is assuming that this gamma is smaller than two. We don't know it on this slide yet, yeah? but uh, this will be exponent of uh, just Care corrected uh, black hole that is asymptotically flat. Uh, so this time we don't need to perturb it um, by some external sources, by some boundary conditions. Now uh, this uh, non smoothness comes from the quantum theory. So we see that whether this non smoothness is a singularity or not depends on the size of those things. And so we should look at those sides. Uh, so those lambdas are actually easier, and you can show using techniques from quantum field theory that uh, they are always positive in any consistent theory containing this graviton. And this is very good because if we look at this, those lambdas come with minus. So there is minus lambda here and minus lambda over here. So it means that those two terms make this smaller than two. And, but there is still the question of this uh, eta. Uh, on the other hand, this eta has a, uh, when you try to calculate it from Q, uh, quantum field theory uh, methods in four dimensions, this, uh, this has some logarithmic divergence that for people who like QFT, it comes from, it is a two loop, uh, two photon loop uh, effect. But what, what it, it means is just that it, uh, it changes with scale. And in the deep infrared, it can be, uh, it actually diverges. Uh, but close to the UV, so at high energies or small scales, uh, it behave, it's given up to some positive coefficient. It's given in the following form. So ms uh, are masses of scalars in our theory, mf are masses of fermions in our theory, and mv are masses of vector uh, vec uh, vector fields in our theory. And if we believe in standard model, then the lightest fields that we have are neutrinos that are uh, uh, that are fermions. Uh, so that would mean that this term contributes. So close to this UV, so if at least in large energies, this, this is going to be positive. And I'm sorry, this is going to be negative. And at least for the standard matter content, the standard model matter content. Uh, and you, you could think that the natural scale in this problem, when you try to evaluate it, would be given by the radius of a black hole. So it's very large. So it would see that we are actually in the infrared and not in the UV. But when you plug in the numbers, uh, you may find out that astrophysical black holes, even the largest black holes that we have in our universe, from the point of view of this coefficient, uh, they are actually uh, deeply in the UV. So they are very small, apparently. Uh, so it means that it's really close to this. And in particular, it, it's negative uh, even at astrophysical scales. Um, so, and this is again good because, so this thing is negative. Uh, and, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm you say uh, even in for the astrophysical scale, but I'm saying that you're still sitting in the no, no, it's without a, this is without a cosmological constant now. 
there's nothing interesting to do in this in IDS anymore because we get the singularity. So now it's asymptotically flat contact. So this eta is negative, and again, it's good because eta comes with a positive sign here. So it means that all those three, all those three terms are negative. So this excellence is definitely smaller than true. So it means that for standard model matter content, um, this exponent is uh, negative. Uh, in, but not only for standard model, you can show that if your quantum theory uh, has a supersymmetry that this eta is exactly zero. So then it's again, it means that this exponent is negative. So if you believe in supersymmetry, you also get this result. Um, but on the other hand, there are some models in which there are very large uh, scalar fields in our universe that are very weakly interacting that we didn't notice and they could and they should be even lighter than neutrinos and then it would be positive. So in a sense there is this funny interplay that here we have something a priori astrophysical we are talking about supermassive black holes uh, and uh, wh wh whether they behave singularly or not depends on uh, what are what is the matter content of our quantum theory. Mm. And just say that this this result is in a way universal because it just comes from this EFT description, so it's very approach agnostic. So uh, either if you're doing string theory or LPG or something else entirely, as long as you have appropriate matter content, you should see the singular these singularities. So what else one could do is a quantum this uh, one could work on quantum description of this whole story because. Most of my slides were about purely classical stuff. And as I mentioned in recent years, there was a um, there was a lot of work done, for example, by Jan over there on uh, quantum uh, eczema black holes. Uh, but uh, they always assumed that those nasty perturbations that we consider are not soft. And we see that if they're sourced, at least classically, they can change stuff like thermodynamics. So one should check whether they can be important or not at the quantum level. We have some guesses about it, but that would be spoiler. Uh, one could ask about some observational astrophysical probes of a new physics, um, because um, this effect that I mentioned is rather very small. So, uh, the fastest uh, spinning black hole that we have in our universe has, roughly speaking, um, a that is of order 0.92m. And we would like it to be so. This is all 92 up to 95, depending on the astrophysical model. And we would like it to be something of the order, I don't know, um, one minus 10 to minus 20. Uh, to, to actually observe it. Uh, so we, it, it, it seems rather unrealistic that uh, we will observe it, but not not for any fundamental reason. So we don't need large curvature or anything like that. But it just seems that astrophysically such sufficiently fast spinning black holes are not available. Mm -hmm. So one could ask if there are some better probes of this, since this uh, since this new physics can actually qualitatively change the behavior of astrophysical objects. Uh, uh, all everything I said happened in four dimensions. The story in five dimensions and higher is actually much richer. And then we get this RG instability on a generic basis. So it means that in ADS, uh, what happens close to the horizon is extremely, is very, very uh, sensitive to what happens at infinity. Uh, we found in this way a lot of new so new new horizon geometries, but we're still lacking some bigger picture. Mm. 
And since most of this talk was in ADS, it would be natural to get a better understanding of what those results mean holographically, uh, especially in higher dimensions where we get these instabilities. So that's all on my side. Thank you for your attention. I should, I should just decide to be married very uh, minor and not very important that if you admit, if you like to admit higher order the derivatives in field equations, in Einstein equations, that you may do it not only by adding some nonlinear uh, terms in the curvature, but also some uh, covariant derivatives of the of the curvature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, but but those uh, those you can integrate by parts, and actually you can no, show no, if you take the, the square for instance, the square of the, the uh, of the uh, covariant derivative. Of R. Uh, using uh, integrating by parts using Bianchi identities and doing filter normalization, uh, filter, filter definitions, you can actually show that this is uh, that this is the most general term. So you can add term like you said, but then you can integrate by parts and use Bianchi identity to actually put it into the song. Ah, integrate by parts is not a local uh, thing. Therefore, you put something outside. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but here we are just looking at the equations of motion. So, from the point of view of equations of motion, mm -hmm. adding this term would not change anything. But in general, sure. And in, if we would go to ten uh, yeah, higher yeah. order, at some point you need to include those terms as well. The energy content, the field mm -hmm. will be different. Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. But here it's yeah. But if you only care about equations, then it's fine. Yeah, I'm just going to clear that all these horizons uh, were pronounced. Yeah, they were still extreme. Yeah. So, so the integrate of the horizon notion, it is like Marshall Dark Professor. Excellent point. Yeah. Uh, so Najumdar Papa Pedro is um, with her is with her cosmological constant, right? And it's actually smooth. Uh, but if we go to higher dimensions, then in higher dimensions, uh, Majumdar Papa Pedro is no longer smooth. So if I remember correctly, generically it's only C2 in five dimensions, and in higher dimensions is actually C1. And if you would uh, repeat this analysis that I showed you uh, in higher dimensions, that you would find out that uh, Majumdar Papadjo is not smooth exactly because of this effect. But fortunately, there are no higher than. <laughs> I have a question here. Am I there any questions? Um, I have one. Okay, thank you again. Thank you.